prepare, as uh, Dr. Glaeus says, for the contagion next time. The doctor is a, he's a physician, epidemiologist, and author. I hope you have had a chance to, to come and see him in our two previous uh, uh, events with him. He's the Robert A. Knox Professor and Dean at the Boston University School of Public Health. He's the former chair of epidemiology at the Columbia University Mailman School of Public Health. He's a regular contributor to a range of public media about social causes of health, mental health, and the consequences of trauma. Uh, he's been listed as one of the um, most widely cited scholars in social sciences. And in fact, he, he worked with uh, the Carter Center mental health folks. Uh, they were the ones who, who first recommended, uh, recommended him to us. Uh, his views on what needs to be done to prepare for and avoid a repeat of the, the last couple of years may surprise you. And I'm pleased that we've got WABE's Rose Scott, host of A Closer Look, to join in the conversation because that's exactly what we want to do. Take a closer look at the contagion next time. You'll have a chance to ask your own questions a little bit later. There's a Q&A box at the bottom of the screen where you can put your questions in. And you'll also be able to get copies of the book with a signed book plate from Acapella Books. Uh, get that online from them as well. So uh, with that said, Rose, let's take a closer look at the contagion next time. Thank you, Tony, and good evening, everyone. You know, as Tony mentioned, um, normally, under normal circumstances, we would all be together. And Tony, I feel like it's been a long time. I've, I've had so many conversations at the Carter Center, and it seems like it's been a long time. And, you know, Doctor, the hope was last year, at this time in 2021, we would have returned to some sense of normalcy, whatever that is but the coronavirus pandemic continues. However, we know there's good news, of course, and we are in a better place than this time last year. And a question I've been asking a lot on our midday program, Closer Look, uh, actually several questions, but two in particular, what are the lessons learned from pu a public health policy standpoint? And then simply, where do we go from here? And Dr. Your book, The Contagion Next Time, at the core addresses all of that. And that's what we're going to get into. But before we take a deeper dive into the contagion next time, um, I like to open up with some reflection. You know, just days ago, we learned the global deaths from COVID-19 had surpassed 5 million. And doctor, when you think back to 20 months ago, if someone had told you that, you know, what do you think your response would have been? That we're going to reach 5 million deaths worldwide. Yeah. So first of all, thank you. Thank you, Rose, for uh, engaging with this conversation. And thank you to the Carter Center for hosting us. The uh, COVID-19 has truly been a tragedy, and, and we, we can never forget that. It has been an enormous tragedy. Five million deaths worldwide. There were 700,000 plus Americans who have died. Uh, it became the third leading cause of death in 2020. It's actually hard to wrap our brain around it. If I were to tell you today that in 2024, a disease we've never heard of, we don't even know its name right now, is going to come out of nowhere and become the third leading cause of death in 2024. I think we'd all say, wow, oh my goodness, like, what should we do to prevent that? But that's what happened. You know, December 30th, 2019, none of us had heard of COVID-19. Of COVID 2020 it becomes the third leading cause of death after heart disease and cancer. So this has really been a tragic moment. And I, I think nothing redeems a tragedy like this. Like these are lives lost, friends, mothers, fathers, children, aunts, uncles, lovers, lives lost. But surely we do a disservice to the lives lost if we do not use this moment to learn, if we do not use this moment to say what happened, what happened, what do we learn from this moment so that we can do better next time. And I suppose what I've been doing, you know, at the beginning when COVID hit, like everybody else, I was completely caught up in what is this? How do we make sense out of this? And then as 2020 started unfolding, we started getting to the second half of 2020, I really started asking myself, what are we learning and how do we try to capture these learnings so that this moment becomes a teachable moment so that we never live through this kind of tragedy again? And it's clear to me that 
another pandemic will happen. It's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. I mean, this is, a, I, I don't think there's much, much argument about that among scientists anywhere. Which then means, okay, what, how do we prepare the country and the world to deal with it? And I think there's going to be a lot of conversation and more and more conversation in the coming years about elements of medicine that we need to deal with, better vaccines, better surveillance, better therapeutics. And I think all of that is important. But I wanted to inject in that conversation a focus on what I think really also needs to happen, and without which none of that will be enough, which is a focus on the conditions of the world around us that made us so vulnerable to the virus this time. And we should note the U.S. leads the world in the number of confirmed deaths from the virus. We're looking at more than 745,000 here in the U.S., followed by Brazil with 607,000 and India with more than 450,000. Uh, Dr. How, er how early on did you as a scientist, as an epidemiologist recognize that this virus was drastically different than the other outbreaks, SARS and Zika and Ebola especially? What was different? Yeah, I think, I think it, it hit me. I, I, I don't um, take any credit for it dawning on me any earlier than anybody else. I think for a lot of us who are in the space, in the epidemiology space, this really um, crystallized in the early, early March of 2020. And in early March of 2020, I wrote a couple of pieces as did some others saying, this is coming and it is going to affect us in a particular way, in particular drawing attention to the people who are going to feel the brunt of this virus. And uh, by particularly drawing attention to those who are marginalized socially, economically, people of color in general, and unfortunately, those predictions all, all were borne out. They, 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 all, they all happened exactly the way we had written about them, the way others had written about them. And, and, and the reason I, I draw attention to that is because there was no surprise about what happened when the virus hit. Like we, we knew this would happen. And I think what breaks my heart is, well, if we knew, right, this would happen, we should have done better. Like if we knew, we should have done better. And I suppose part of my commitment, part of why I wrote this book, part of why I'm sort of doing conversations like this is to try to say, we should not make the same mistakes again. Mm -hmm. Something else that I, I, I've been doing my research, because uh, that's what we do as journalists. Um, in late September, you gave a presentation, uh, Priorities for Post-COVID-19 Public Health Research, Education and Practice, uh, talking about the virus. And I want to take this moment because you began that presentation with what went right with COVID-19. And I want you to give the virtual audience a brief assessment of that. Yeah, thank you. And, and, and I do some of that in the book as well. And uh, I think it's important to be clear-eyed you know, about what we're doing right and what we're doing wrong. So I think two big things went right in COVID-19. Number one is our medical care system. Like when people were in hospital, we learned very quickly how to, how to do the best we could to help people survive the virus. So when the virus first hit in March of 2020, mortality of people in hospital was about, was about 25%, really high mortality. Two months later, by, by May, that was down to under 5%. So if you think about it, within just a couple of months, our medical care system figured out something that we had never known before and dropped mortality by about fivefold. That is incredible. And in fact, mm -hmm. There really is, the evidence all suggests that once people were in hospital, people were looked after well, and that people, the medical care system did as well as possibly could to help people survive the virus. So that's number one thing we did well. The second thing, and of course, perhaps the most dramatic thing was the vaccines, that we developed safe, effective vaccines in extraordinarily rapid time. Like we went from virus first hitting America to, virus, to vaccines ready for distribution in about eight months. That is incredible. I mean, vaccines usually take 10 years. The fastest ever vaccine we had was mumps, which was about three years. So these two things went right. And, and I think it's important to recognize that, to say two things. Number one is to recognize, A, to balance what went right with what went wrong. And B, also to recognize that the reason the medical care system went right, the reason the vaccines were developed so quickly, is because we had invested in, in hospital care and in vaccines, the mRNA platform that became the platform for vaccine, we had been investing in for more than 10 years. So actually we showed as a country that what we invest in, we can do well from. And conversely, of course, it highlights that the things that did not go well 
are things because we have not invested in them. So I think it serves the purpose of saying we did well because we've paid attention to these things, you know, because we actually have very good hospitals. Yes, because we actually have a lot of money being invested in vaccine technology. That's why we did well. Everything else that went wrong is because we have not paid attention to them. And, and I suppose really my mission with this book is to, of course, shift our gaze to everything else. Not as an or, this is not an or argument. It's an and argument. It's a, it is a, a being upfront and honest about respect for the medical system that did well, respect for the vaccines that we got to very quickly, but saying that itself is not enough. And that list of areas that were underinvested in, that's a very, very long list. And that's another conversation. But let's talk about it. Let's talk. Very long list. Let's talk about the contagion next time. Is there a moment that sparked this idea to write? Because I feel like in reading this, you, along with so many other experts, you all have had this 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 knowledge, this assessment of how we approach public health policy and, and inequities and disparities and all of that. You all are well aware of that. So even in reading this book, you you take the reader through. Okay, before we dig into COVID nineteen, understand the framework and the space that we've been in for some time to to prepare them into this journey of of hey this is what we need to do the next time. So when did you decide to write the book? Yeah, so, you know, I'm trained as a primary care and emergency doctor. And uh, in um, my training in primary care emergency medicine, there's a concept that we call teachable moment. And the, the idea behind teachable moment is, um, let's say somebody is um, somebody's drinking too much. And then one day, because they're drinking, they fall and they break a bone and they come to the emergency department. And that's a teachable moment where you say, look, here's the harms you're bringing upon yourself because you're drinking. And let's use this moment now to look at the drinking and fix that, not just, right? Because, because things are acute in people's minds. And I suppose in summer of 2020, uh, I started seeing this as potentially a teachable moment because the underlying problems that I'm identifying in the book I could have identified five years ago. It had nothing really to yeah. do with the pandemic. Mm -hmm. and, but I started in the summer, if you, all, if you all remember, towards the end of summer of 2020, right? we had a lull in the, in, in, uh, in the pandemic. There was a lull that, uh, all over the country. And I remember at that moment started to think, I mean, first of all, it was clear it was gonna, we're going to have another wave. Mm -hmm. And I remember thinking, this could be a teachable moment for us. And can we use the pandemic to then drive home this point to say, let's fix these underlying problems because we're now paying attention and we're paying attention in a way that we haven't paid attention for decades. I mean, really the thesis of the book is that a lot of these conditions that we've been paying attention to are 20, 30, 40 years. Like we have, yeah. we have underinvested, underpaid attention for a long time. So that the pandemic galvanized our attention to them should be something that we don't lose. I don't want to lose that. I don't want to lose the teachable moment and to say, now is the time to actually do better. In the chapter, An Unhealthy Country, you write, I'm going to quote you here, preparing for the next pandemic means first understanding the ways we are currently unhealthy in the United States, the deeper causes of this poor health, and how we can fix them. And I want to focus on that, that we, is that we, this a collective group from, from federal to state to local and more of a holistic approach to how we prepare for the next pandemic? Yeah, thank you for focusing on that. Yeah, I believe strongly in that we. And um, the reason I believe strongly in that we comes from how I see our health. I mean, I see, as I'm explicit in the book, health as a public good. I see health as a public good, which means that I, I have the awareness that my health is not something I can buy or sell. Your health is not something you can buy or sell. What I can buy or sell is sick care, is care for me when I'm sick. That's what you can also buy or sell. But your and my health depends on the world around us, the air we breathe, the water we drink, the food we eat, whether we live in safe neighborhoods free from violence. And those are, those are traits that we are going to get to because of a shared investment in the world around us. And one cannot get to that without a we. We need to get to that. I, Sandro, cannot, cannot get it for myself. You, Rose, can get it for yourself. We need to get it. And when you start thinking this way, you recognize that the production of health, the generating health, has to come from a place of shared ownership of our health and a compassion for our fellow human beings, all of whom partake in this shared ownership of health. So I actually think we is really important. We is 
the ethos really to how we generate health for the public. And it means you and I as citizens, it mm -hmm. means decision-making at the local level, at the state level, at the federal level. And it means the conversation that we, the citizens, we, the citizens have about what it is that we care about because we care about our health. I want to shift for a moment. What happens when politics gets in the way of we? Uh, I think we experienced that. Yeah, well, well, we can we can go down that rabbit hole for a second. Um, you know, let me let me maybe let, let, let's nudge that for a second. Mm -hmm. You know, any conversation that's about resources is a political conversation because politics by definition is allocation of resources, right? And I, I actually have no problem with politics. I, I think the, the tragedy of the moment has been less politics than it's been partisanship. And, um, and, uh, and I think there's an important distinction there because I think a partisanship substitutes for reason and logic and it substitutes almost a, a blind belief in the color of your political parties, be it red or be it blue. And uh, what I think we saw happen in uh, COVID is this extreme pitting of red versus blue ideas that defied our ability to reason our way into the right approach to COVID, defied our ability to weigh the pros and cons of COVID, that defied our ability to say, let's, let's think carefully, for example, whether it is worth our while to close schools, whether the risks outweigh the benefits. We, we, could, we, we could no longer even have those conversations because partisanship made some things red positions and blue positions. And it made it like, if you're seen in the blue camp, if you say this, all, all of a sudden you've become a turncoat, you've become red. Or if you're in the red camp, if you say this, all of a sudden you've become blue. And I think that really damaged, really damaged our ability to, as a country, find the collective we where we could have honest conversations and say, there are some risks that we're willing to take because there are other things that will happen if we don't take those risks. And we, we never had that conversation. But at the core of that too, doctor, was that if we know the mission of public health at the core is about delivery of services and, and providing health needs to the masses without these barriers, you all know that. That's, that's the mission of public health, right? So then it shouldn't be this, this argument, whether you're in the blue camp or the red camp or the purple camp or the purple camp, but we saw that. And, and quite frankly, some will say lives were lost because of that, because oh, folks just did not, they just totally dismissed the mission of what public health was about. And this pandemic was that, th this was the instance we needed public health policy to be at its best, not politics. I couldn't agree more. I, I, I couldn't agree more. I actually think it is, um, it, it, it was an extraordinarily damaging polarization that, that hijacked the, the collectivism that is at the heart of public health. And, and you know, without being overly partisan about it, it's hard not to lay the, a lot of the blame on that at the very top, that uh, there was a president when, uh, when COVID hit, who for whatever set of reasons, saw this primarily as an issue concerning his chances of re-election and, and brought about enormous cleavages in saying, this is what you have to believe if you're red. This is, if you believe that, you must be blue. And that fractured us. It took away what you just said, Rose, which is our ability to say, we're doing this for us. And, you know, and, and that's really painful because I, I've had the privilege of talking to people sort of both sides of the political spectrum many times from my career. And there's one thing that nobody ever disagrees with. Nobody ever disagrees that they want their children to be healthy. Mm -hmm. everybody, everybody loves their children. Everybody wants their children to be healthy. And so health can be a uniting value. Like health should be a uniting value. This pandemic should have united us, not divided us. And our politics took the totally opposite approach, which is really, really sad. Later on in the book, you write, COVID-19 showed where the link between place and social marginalization is perhaps less obvious, though not less significant for health, particularly health in a time of pandemic. And then you go on to talk about adults age 65 and older. You use that for the reader as an example about this link between place and social marginalization. 
Yeah, the, the you know one of the points I make is is that uh, our health is inextricably linked to place and it's inextricably linked to history. So let, let, let's use one concrete example, which I trace in the book. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I talk in the book about how historical marginalization, let's talk specifically about Black Americans, historical marginalization of Black Americans, and we can also talk about Latinx Americans, Indigenous Americans, but just use Black Americans as an example here. The marginalization of Black Americans, which of course had well, the apotheosis in the institution of slavery and then Jim Crow laws, et cetera, all of that, for example, led to the institution of redlining. Like that was sort of, I'm just tracing history. Redlining was a, a result of a federal government program that tried to encourage Americans to buy homes. And as a result, was guiding banks about areas which the federal government was encouraging banks to, to lend money for mortgages. Now, what the federal government was doing, this is in the 1930s, it was redlining and drawing in red on a map. Mm -hmm. The areas where African-Americans live telling banks don't lend to African-Americans. Now, what did that result in? That resulted in segregated cities mm -hmm. and it resulted in a lack of wealth accumulation among black Americans. Fast forward, fast forward now to the, to the uh, 21st century where we are. As a result, you have disproportionately black Americans living in homes that are less, that are less big, there's more people to homes than there are, than are white Americans. All of that's directly traced to this history. Then you get a, a respiratory virus like uh, SARS-CoV-2, which is COVID-19, where actually your ability to distance from other people is determinative of whether or not you're going to get COVID. Now, if you have more people per square foot, you are have greater risk of getting COVID. And right there, you have one of the reasons why we had a disproportionate greater um, chance of getting COVID among Black Americans than white Americans, which then translates into differential mortality. So I suppose the point I'm trying to make is, right, I'm trying to connect the dots through historical time and place and to show how marginalization, systemic marginalization, followed by systemic racism, results in very specific um, features of people's lives that made particular groups more vulnerable to COVID than other groups. And, and in some respects, to go back to what we were saying a second ago, there's nothing new about that. Like, like, like yeah. it was entirely predictable. And yeah. the fact that we saw it happen, to my mind, does two things. Number one, again, it gets at this sort of heartbreak that like, if it's so predictable, why didn't we do something about it? And secondly, maybe now is the teachable moment to say, that's just not right. That's just not right. And we should do better than that. Early on, because the focus was on our most vulnerable populations, which were our, our aging community, and then we looked at the obviously the, the uninsured or underinsured, and we looked at people of color, and we looked at folks that lived in, in low income communities, and we looked at low wage earners, because these are folks that still had to go to work. You know, so when states shut down and Georgia kind of short down, <laughs> kind of shut down in a way, in a, a little bit. Yeah. Um, but but as folks, as as states shut down, those folks from what would be considered maybe marginalized communities. We're at we're in this high pop, we're in this high risk population, and some folks said, "Well, we should have identified them early on with those that with the the sixty five and older." And I guess my question is then: Did we did the health community this did, did y'all over maybe not intentionally this high risk population because we were so focused on the older community, and then did we move too slow in focusing on other high risk groups? And, and, and the answer is yes. The answer is absolutely yes. And, and we took approaches that were we, we, we took approaches that were very blunt and affected everybody equally. But affecting everybody equally is not the same as equitably. So let's take the, the, the data from the Bureau of Labor Statistics are very clear. The higher income job you're in, higher wage jobs, the greater your likelihood of being able to work from home. And in fact, you know, I could show you a graph that mm -hmm. this way goes a straight line like this. So when we said, when we said our approach to this pandemic is going to be to shut it down, right? So what's that mean when you shut it down? Well, it means that people with high wage jobs have the luxury of going in their home and continuing to work. It mm -hmm. means that people in low wage jobs who are disproportionately people of color in this country, um, they don't have that luxury. They're still um, coming face to face with another, still a greater risk of the virus. And um, that's the group that then had the higher rate of infection right at the beginning. So what would be an alternate approach? An alternate approach would be to say, wait a second, wait a second. If we just shut everything down, here's what's going to happen. People in low-wage jobs are going to lose their job. And in order to keep their job, they're going to go to work and they're going to be at higher risk. 
what is an alternative? Well, an alternative would be, as you said, to say, well, who is most vulnerable to the virus? And people over age 65, people with underlying morbidity and mortality, let's make sure that those people are actually not exposed to the virus and implement programs so we can actually protect those people. And that would be the alternative. And we did not do that. I mean, nowhere near it. We, 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 just, we just didn't do it at all. Let's talk then about governance because mm-hmm. I've had so many conversations and you touch on this in the book. People say, well, it should have been, some say, that from in Washington, they should have set the, the blanket, the generalizations of these are the mandates. This is what, what's going to happen and not leave it up to states because we're in a pandemic. Others will say, well, no, each state was different. What was happening in Georgia might not have been happening in, in, in Iowa. But what's your take on that? Should yeah. Washington should have said, look, this is something new for us. We're going to have these mandates. This is what's going to be in place. And everybody has to follow it. Point blank and period. I think the, the, the easy answer is yes. That's absolutely what should have happened. The, the, the reason I say this, the easy answer is because when, when the pandemic unfolded in March, summer of 2020, mm-hmm. if you remember, there was so much bungling coming out of Washington and so much bungling coming out of federal agencies that I don't think they were in any position to tell anybody what to do. So in some respects, in a, in the easy answer is yes, in a, in a highly functioning federal government system, that, that this is a national emergency that should trump, in some respects, individual state autonomy. But at the same time, I wonder, I'm just being honest, mm-hmm. I wonder whether or not the fact that actually we did allow heterogeneity didn't help us because I'm not convinced that in 2020 we would have received the right set of guidance and rules and regulations coming centrally, given, given, given the evidence as to how badly handled federally things were. That is a fair assessment. Um, so I will move on from that. But yes. I will follow up with then, because I've been reading, this pandemic will force a, a I guess, remodeling of effective public health governance. And I'm assuming through your lens, you agree with that. I, I agree with that. And I've, I've had the privilege of being part of a, a number of conversations on that. If anybody who's watching is interested, the National Academy of Medicine um, issued a, a, a working paper on just that, actually, on how to rethink the governance of public health. And there are not, a lot of ideas in there. And that, um, you know, the, the one of the things that we have underinvested in, because I started off by saying, here are our successes, here are things we've invested in. One of the things we've underinvested in historically is public health. So we have fewer public health workers now than we had 10 years ago and then we had 20 years ago. Most states spend less than $100 person on public health. In fact, most counties in the country spend substantially more on their police force than they do on their public health force. And, uh, the, and even though there have been things like the Public Health Prevention Fund, which have been passed by Congress, historically what happens, these things pass and then they're chipped away at, and the money doesn't actually go into public health. And if money goes into public health, what tends to happen is, and I've written a couple of papers on this, is you get these spikes of money for very specific purposes. So it's like you have the public health you know, budget, but then you have these enormous spikes where health departments have to spend a lot of money very quickly, and then it goes away, which means you never actually build the public health infrastructure. And without that public health infrastructure, something like this happens and you don't have the surge capacity to all of a sudden develop tests and to be able to to screen people, to be able to do contact tracing, all the things that now became sort of part of the general conversation. Um, We we as a country essentially did not have capacity to do it to scale. We had capacity to do it in a micro level, but not to scale. And, And that really hurt us. With the contagion next time, and I want to be fair and I want folks to read and some folks who probably already read it, but with the contagion next time, is it, is it this outline of missteps from a global standpoint? And you're also comparing to here in the United States in terms of the approach to public health policy. I mean, look, we can't control what another nation does. And I think even with the criticism that the World Health Organization received, which personally I thought was a little unfair, but that's just me. I'm not a public health expert. Um, those missteps first, doctor, from a global standpoint, mm-hmm. what do you see? And then compare that to the U.S. Yeah, so, um, I mean, the, the book is, I think, I, I would characterize as grounded in the global lens, but it's very much a domestic focus, yeah. because I do think it's actually very difficult to write a book like this about with given heterogeneity across the world. I actually agree with you completely. I think the, um, 
the criticisms of WHO. I think there were missteps at WHO, but I think the criticisms were uh, were unfair. It was a, it was an extraordinary time, and I think everything else in balance. Um, I think the World Health Organization did a very good job. The um, you know looking at it from a global lens, the um, the, the there is. You know, we, we can't forget it's a big world and there are very different value sets and different ways of operating mm -hmm. across countries all over the world. I mean, take let's let's compare us to China just for a second. I mean, China is the last remaining country that is adopting what what is called a zero COVID approach. It's trying to just say make all COVID go away, but it's doing that through this enormously draconian effort that as soon as there's any cases are detected, right, whole neighborhoods are being shut down and people are not allowed to leave their house. I mean, these are efforts that we would never find acceptable in the U.S. Like, we, 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 they, they contravene such fundamental elements of our social compact that it would be completely unacceptable to us. So the WHO is trying to balance that, right? It's trying to balance what one country is doing, what another country is doing that reflect deeply countries' um, uh, long-held beliefs and value systems. So I think globally, this has also been a challenge. And there are also many conversations, by the way, going on right now about thinking of a global public health framework that can help us in moments like this. There, is a, there was, there was a, a document written, which I was a part of around the global public health convention that would be transparent and enforceable. There are other efforts moving forward. And I think we're going to see these efforts come to the fore. And I suppose part of what I'm trying to do here is to make sure that as those efforts come to the fore, we do not forget the foundational reasons why we and all other countries did that did poorly did poorly because we were had not tended to the foundation of risk even before the pandemic. So I don't want us to see us just focus on pandemic surveillance and detection. I want to see us on focus on building sustainable, stable, healthy populations that are resistant to a pandemic. You also take the reader through, I guess, in a sense, uh, the tentacles tied to the pandemic as it relates to social racial, economic justice. You know, on, on Closer Look, we, we like to say that we touch all the quality of life tentacles attached to all of us. You know, education, health and wellness, workforce development, housing, transit and mobility, because all of those sectors, we all are touched by that. You make the case when you're talking about social and racial and economic justice, and you're taking the reader, you're connecting those dots, which you talked about, and how the pan and at the core of the pandemic amplify all of those inequities within those sectors. Yeah, and 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 I think the the, the world, I mean the country, let me talk about the country. I, I think the country saw this almost clearly almost for the first time, not exactly the first time. I mean that's an exaggeration, but but the civil unrest that emerged in the middle of 2020, which of course was triggered by the killing of unarmed black men and women, particularly George Floyd, but also others. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't just that, right? It was actually the surfacing of these injustices as they were being seen in the enormous unevenness of the experience of the pandemic. And, and I think at some core level, people from all walks of life all of a sudden said, this isn't right. Like this is not right. That And, and, and it must reflect underlying issues that we're not paying attention to. And those underlying issues are deeply seated injustices. And the it is not nothing that the country had the largest civil unrest has ever had. This is reflects legitimate, legitimate anger and unrest about things that we should have fixed a long time ago. So I tried to connect those dots in a way that's accessible. And, uh, you know, I'll, I'll leave it to others. I mean, others will write more specific books about different elements of this. I mean, as you said, I, I did a fairly broad, you know, broad brush overview here, but I think there's a lot more to be written about these different forms of justice and injustice and how they play out in the context of pandemics. And I think it's important that those books are written because it's important that we do not forget. It's important that we not forget what ultimately caused the unevenness of the experience of this pandemic. And all those also lead to this next area that I want to focus on, which is health equity. You know, I mean, you and I earlier talked about someone we, we both have a lot of respect for and Dr. Satcher, Dr. David Satcher. And I remember years ago, he would tell me, you know, Rose, we're going to move away from just always talking about health disparities and focus on health equity. And when we talk about what has to happen to ensure that 
every person is afforded not just access to healthcare, but quality without those barriers. And we saw COVID-19 again, highlight, pull back this curtain. I don't know why for some people it was so, you know, revealing when folks like you and I, we know this, but it was whatever, you know, this was so, this pandemic was so revealing to all these health equity issues that have been around for hundreds of years. Yeah, and uh, I mean, we were talking about Dr. Setcher is sort of one of my heroes, really, and uh, he, um, I, I've used the term health equity instead of disparities for for a couple of decades now, because I actually think it captures more broadly the concept. I mean, just, just to lay it out, it's, um, you know, so much of our unevenness in health, meaning maldistribution of health, is based on sort of income, wealth, and race in this country. But race, just talk about race for a second, you know, race or color of our skin is biologically negligible. Like it's, it's irrelevant. Like if there are differences in health that are indexed by race, it means that they're for social and economic reasons, not for skin color reasons. So it means that our health should not be indexed by our skin color, period. It should be, there should be no difference. There should be no black, white, indigenous, uh, American, Latinx, white difference. There should not be no differences based on these axes. Insofar as there are differences, they are inequitable. They reflect underlying injustices. They reflect historical challenges that particular groups have had in accumulating the assets that protect us from health. That is ultimately what makes it about equity, because equity is about justice. It's not just un unequal. It is inequitable. It's about injustice, which is why a modern public health cannot, it cannot exist without also tackling underlying injustice. The, the, the business of, of social, economic, racial justice has to be part of the core business of public health because you cannot treat, to use that word, your way out of a fundamental inequity. You know, I go back to the example I was using about um, um, housing. It's, it's good to, to ground these things in concrete examples. So the example about, about housing, if you live in a crowded home, you're more likely to get infectious disease than if you don't, period. So yeah. you can, we can say all we want, let's develop a really effective vaccine or treatment, but None of that is going to do anything about the fact crowded home, more likely to turn transmission than less crowded home, period. Like, like none of that is going to change that. So now look, you know, somebody listening to this conversation could say, well, you're being utopian about a world where everybody's equal. And I'm not, I'm not being that at all. I think in a, in a market-driven economy, and we're not challenging those foundations here, that's a separate conversation. Right. Right. There's, always, there's always going to be inequality. That's, that's fine. The question is how much inequality we're willing to tolerate, A. And B is... That, that inequality should not be linked to people's skin color, which again is biologically meaningless. Like it, it, it is, it shouldn't, it shouldn't only be linked to people's achievement and willingness to apply themselves and the extent to which they're actually willing to participate. But right now, that's not the case. I mean, it is the case a little bit, but we have these inequalities which are indexed to social, racial variables that are completely social constructs. And, and that should not be the case. The vaccine is aside, because I asked you earlier to explain to the audience about what, what we got right about COVID-19. The vaccine aside, and as re it relates to the contagion next time, what areas though are you optimistic about in terms of public health policy, our approach? We also have something that we didn't really talk about too, doctor, and that is the personnel. You know. Are we going to, we have a shortage of nurses, you know, we have a shortage of black male doctors, all are key, you know, that, that's yeah. another aspect that we didn't get into, you know, well, we've well, got to, go ahead. I'm sorry, didn't catch you off, I apologize. It's, um, no, I'm just going to say, you know, we've also got to look at our, our, our workforce within the health sector, you know. Yeah, so, so let's, let's, let's talk about optimism, let's talk about optimism, because uh, I do think, um, I do think that optimism matters. I think hope, hope matters. So one of the things that I'm seeing, so my, my, my day job, I'm the dean, I'm privileged of being a dean of a school of public health, a big school of public health. So we're surrounded by young people who are interested in public health. And we've seen a surge of people who are interested in public health, surge of people who are interested in health um, in, um, in the past two years. And that's fabulous, right? It's really wonderful. These are people who are coming into who want to be a part of the solution, who have all the right intentions, who understand this conversation you and I are having, who see 
that the role of public health is inextricable from a role of uh, paying attention to social justice, to racial justice, to economic justice, and who are committed to achieving a radical vision where we no longer have health inequities through the hard, hard work of pragmatic dealing with policy after policy, fixing one thing after another, and recognizing that changing the world is really hard work. It's actually hard work. It's, it's, it is not a bumper sticker. It's the hard work of yeah. policymaking every day. Um, so I, I have the privilege of seeing that every day. And I think that's what gives me hope. I actually, because I actually think the next generation is better than us. And they're, they're, they get these things and they're going to be better. So I actually, I want to see them create a better world. And my challenge always to our, to our students or to anybody who's earlier than, than I am in their, in their life journey is to say, insofar as I'm trying to do something, it's to put out ideas that then fuel your ideas so you can have better ideas that move us forward. In fact, it would be, it would be not right if 20 years from now, they're having the same ideas we're having. The, the, the ideas need to be moved forward. And I'm optimistic that is the case. And you know, we're chatting earlier. I, I I choose hope and optimism because I think it is better than the alternative. And 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 it also reflects a realization. And the book starts off with this a little bit that the world is a better place than it was. Like the world is a better place than it was. I don't think it's a contradiction to say the world is better on many of these axes we're talking about than it was 50 years ago. That doesn't mean that there isn't a lot more that needs to be done. But it is actually. Right. It is better. And, you know, if you say to me, hey, take it here. Um, here's a time machine. Which When do you want to go back in time to? I would say, I don't want to go back in time at all. I actually want to go to the future because I think the future will be even better. So so I, I suppose I'm committed to co- helping us continue in this trajectory. And this doesn't mean, by the way, that we don't take steps backwards. Like we do take steps back, but hopefully we take, if we're going to take one back, we're taking two forward. As we wrap up, did you get everything you wanted to get into the contagion next time? <laughs> you know, sometimes you researchers and scientists, y'all get to write. And <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a very, it's a very good question. Um, uh, you know, nobody's asked me a question. It was a great question. That is, I, um, I, I don't know because you know the truth is that I'm learning and evolving as this is going along. I mean, one thing that's interesting here is that this is a moment in time where there is a lot of learning that I'm also learning as I'm learning from these conversations. So I, I, I think I have thoughts now that are evolved beyond what I wrote when I wrote the book. But, you know, for a book to be published now, you know, I finished writing it a year ago. So my thoughts have evolved. So I think there are new things which I should have in mind, but I don't think I knew them when I wrote the book. Well, who should read this? (laughs) Who should read this? (laughs) Everybody. (laughs) Everybody. (laughs) I think everybody who cares about making sure that when there's a next pandemic, we do better as a world. And, uh, And my hope is that as the national conversation evolves the national conversation about how we're going to be preparing for the next pandemic we do not forget these core foundational issues because if we do it'll really be a tragedy dr galea it's been such a pleasure to be in conversation with you i really enjoyed it thank you so much thank you rose that's really really what a wonderful conversation thank you for taking the time thank you for everything you do thank you and Tony. we also we have an opportunity for our viewers to ask questions in the uh, the Q and A box in uh, at the bottom of the screen. Doctor, there was a phrase that you used early on that just stuck with me about taking shared ownership of our health, and it seems that that is really the core that you want to. Um, that that we need to understand that we are not just doing things for ourselves, whether it is treating other people in terms of um, what's available to them or housing or medical care or whatever, that that it, it's not just about us, it's it's about them as well, and that affects us. Yeah, so so I use the uh, I have a chapter in, in there about compassion. I've had some people say to me, "What a strange chapter to have about a compassion book like this." But I'll explain a little bit what what, what I mean. And um, we we often talk about empathy, right? And empathy is, Tony, I care about you because I can see myself in your shoes. That's fine. Compassion is, I think, a higher order. And uh, and the Reverend Martin Luther King, who is sort of perhaps the most famous graduate of my university, um, you know, wrote quite a bit about compassion. And the point is. 
I care about you, not because I can see the world through your shoes, because actually I don't understand the world in your shoes. I care about you because of our shared humanity, because we share a humanity. You and I and Rose, we're humans. And as a result, we should care about each other just on the basis of our shared humanity. Now, that means that we take collective ownership of our health. And once you have that compassion, you realize this goes back to something that Rose and I started saying at the beginning of our conversation, mm -hmm. that we have to see health as a public good. We have to see health as something that we all share, that my health matters to me. It also matters to you and vice versa. Now, an infectious disease outbreak is perhaps the most teachable moment on that because leaving aside compassion, we all have come to understand that actually my chances of, of getting COVID are decreased if your chances are decreased, right? Because if you're likely to have COVID, Rose likely to have COVID, I'm likely to have COVID, we're gonna give it to each other. So actually, it should force us to say, hey, it's better for me if Rose and Tony don't get COVID because there's less chance for me to get COVID from them. So I'm hoping that this moment, this, this pragmatic recognition that our health is interconnected pushes us to heighten our compassion for each other. And that is a way to get to health as a public good. That is a way to get to the structural change that we need to get there. Well, you know, you and Rose also talked about the global impact of this. And I think the same thing applies there. We had the discussion when, when vaccines were made available in this country and in, in countries that had wealth that could buy a lot, there was the discussion, well, shouldn't we make those vaccines available to other countries? that are less fortunate because you can't fight a pandemic just in your little corner. You have to, you have to reach out in a global world. Yeah, and this is, where, this is where I think the moral argument and the practical argument align. Like there is a moral argument for us making our approaches, let's say the vaccines available to other peoples in other country because it is morally the right thing to do because we have, we have had the money to develop vaccines based, essentially built on the back of very complicated global systems with colonial elements where we have taken advantage, not infrequently, of weaknesses in other countries. So this is, we actually have a responsibility to the world to pay that back. That's number one, that's the moral argument. And there's a practical argument that if other countries are going to have a raging epidemic, even if while we may not, well, that's what's going to be fertile ground for development, let's say of mutations, which become new variants which then will come and affect us as well. So the moral argument and the practical argument align. And, and both, to my mind, militate for us making sure that as much of the world as possible is vaccinated as quickly as possible. Yeah. One of the things that I think uh, this pandemic really showed, as you pointed out, is who the most vulnerable people are because those were the ones early on who who suffered the most and who had the most most deaths, the most vulnerable. Yeah, and, and it is, um, as, as Rose and I said, it was utterly predictable and uh, utterly preventable. And, uh, and, and the, the point of the book is this, is that that will happen again. Doesn't matter how good our vaccines are, doesn't matter how good our treatment is, doesn't matter how good our surveillance system is, that will happen again with the next pandemic unless we tend to the reasons why that happened. And, and I know in some respects, Rose, you said at the beginning that it's sort of clear to people like you and I, and we get that. And in some respects, you can also say it's obvious, but my worry is this is gonna get swept away. We're gonna ignore it and, and go on and focus only on the medicalization of treatment of, of the epidemic. And this will happen again. And, you know, I find people when I make this argument are in bit two poles. I have some people who say that's obvious. And the other poll is people who say, that's radical. Well, right. yeah. perhaps it is, I, I don't know, maybe it's a bit of both, or maybe the truth is somewhere in the middle, because it is radical, but it's also obvious. And, uh, and uh, I, I suppose, I, you know, I ask, well, if it's so obvious, why haven't we done it yet? And the reason we've done it is because it's also radical. And, and we, you know, I, I believe in the public conversation. I believe that the public conversation, what we agree on as a society, eventually we make happen. And you see that time and time again. I mean, take it, you, you see it, for example, in smoking. 
And once the public conversation was that smoking is is harmful, right? Smoking mm -hmm. went down from 80% of adults smoking to now 10, 15% of adults who smoke, right? That emerged from the public conversation. We see it around changes in things like, for example, same-sex marriage. Public conversation shifted, same-sex marriage shifted as well. Um, so th the public conversation on this can shift. We are at a place where we see health inequities as acceptable. We see them as acceptable and it's just a thing that's there we can't do anything about it once the public conversation shifts to say that shouldn't be acceptable well yeah. then then it'll change and then we'll do the things that we need to do to change it so i suppose i'm trying to chip away at that i'm trying to inject my these ideas so that to shift the public conversation and in the book i talk about the overton window which is this idea of you know there's a window of things with that we talk about so we talk about things between here and here and one can shift that and one can shift that, and that's what we're trying to do here. And you know, sometimes I'm sorry, Tony. I was just going to say, no, go ahead. Sometimes, sometimes for some folks, they need to have this visual, or they need to hear the personal stories because the the data isn't enough. You know, every day we can give these numbers of the deaths, the hospitalizations, the, the number of new infections, and then as we started to shift and bring people in to the conversation to share their personal stories. A photographer who said, yeah, I flew to New York. I didn't wear a mask. I didn't, I didn't care about all that. I didn't think it could happen to me. He almost died, you know? Those personal stories and people hear those stories, um, I think sometimes that can have an effect and that might shift people's you know, opinion. And that's sad to, to, to think that because I think sometimes people get so much thrown at them with numbers and doctor you know this you yeah. throw a lot of numbers and data at people and you know dr fauci you bless him with all his charts people look at that and they're like i don't know what this means i just want to know am i gonna survive you know what i'm saying and, and, and look i agree completely and, and rose this is in some respects i guess why i write a book like this it's a uh, you know i live in the dr fauci's world of numbers and charts and uh you tell the stories and i'm very grateful to you for, for doing that i love i love how you do that and uh, so i suppose in part i see a book like this as a piece of translation i'm trying to translate the the world of books and charts to bring it to people like you who are master storytellers because i'm under no illusion that the 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 general public isn't really going to listen to me and in fact and it's not really my job, actually. Like, like I'm actually, I'm, I'm okay with that, right? What I'm trying to do is I'm trying to make these ideas accessible so that people who are the natural storytellers, people who are listened to by sort of the proverbial everybody around the kitchen table have the material to tell these stories. So I, I sort of see, I go back to the we, and you know, a lot of those conversations about the we, if I may, Rose, it's uh, I sort of see, and I, you know, I don't know, maybe you agree, maybe you disagree. I hope you agree, though. I think we, you and I, have a partnership on this. It's like, I have a job, like I'm in the academy, I have a job to sort of take this, to produce the data, but also have a responsibility to make that accessible. And you have a job to take these ideas and communicate them to the wider public. And that's where it gets to do we. I, I can't do this by myself. And I'd like to think, I don't think you can do it by yourself either, which gets us at, at sort of a pushing these ideas forward together. Rose is right, because it's, it's those images of the, um, family members who are outside on the other side of the glass and they can't get in or the, the, the nurse holding a phone up to a patient who is, is dying that really touches people to give them the, the feeling that, that you know, it, it's, it's not just numbers, it's people who have fathers and mothers and brothers and, and sisters and the, uh, the like. The thing that worries me, doctor, is that we in this country have this tradition of being reaction, uh, being reactors rather than planning ahead. Uh, we will react to a crisis, but we tend not to um, prepare for one. Even, even for pandemics, um, there were preparations and there were classes and there are stockpiles but then the if there's no pandemic the stockpiles aren't kept up and the industry that makes masks disappears and we are so much better at reacting than preparing 
Well, you know, so I use the metaphor in the book, if I may share, of the ship in a storm. And uh, I use the metaphor that um, when you have a ship going through a storm, that's not the time to fix the hole in the hull. Like when you're going through a storm, all you're trying to do is hold on for dear life and hope to make it through the storm. The time to fix the hole in the hull is when there's no storm and when the water's calm, when you can get the ship out to dry land and then fix the hole in the hull. So I suppose what I'm trying to do is to say, there's a hole in the hull. Now we're going through the storm right now. So I'm not, I, have no, I have no high hopes about fixing it. But what I don't want to happen, you know, once the water gets calm again, you're going to say, well, the hole's not a big deal. We're still floating. It's not such a big deal. Because again, the storm will come and then all of a sudden we'll start sinking. So I suppose part of this is investing in the conversation to say, as soon as the storm stops, we need to fix this hole because the next storm is going to come and it's going to sink us again. And one of the things that that I think made this one so difficult is that different groups felt, young people felt, it's not going to affect me or um, uh, other groups, well, I'm healthy. And until it started affecting them and claiming them as victims, um, it was seen, this is a pandemic of the elderly and the sick. Yeah, and, and this, you know, this gets at two things. One, it gets at the lack of compassion, that, uh, that uh, compassion says, even if it doesn't affect me and my particular demographic group, whatever is defined by age, race, whatever, um, um, it still matters, and it matters to me as much as it should matter if it's affecting me, number one. And number two, it's actually also based on a pragmatic misunderstanding that it's an infectious disease, and uh, if it affects more of us, it's going to affect each of us. And uh, th I go back to the whole argument is making by global. The moral imperative aligns with the aligns with the practical imperative. And that's a good thing if we want action. And, and the fact that we did not communicate that gets a little bit back to something Rose and I were talking about earlier about, I think, the failure of both practical and moral leadership at a federal level when this happened. Because in, in some respects, the conditions were there for focused collective action. And that we did not, we're not able to do that is really, is really a pity. Yeah. Doctor, I want to thank you. This is, you know, I was thinking this is really fitting to have at the Carter Presidential Library because I think back when, when Jimmy Carter was growing up, um, his mom was a nurse and she, she was a private nurse and she was always called out to help people uh, regardless of race, regardless of of income, uh, and in fact, they had a, a table uh, just off the living room that the kids used to call mother because she was gone all the time and she would leave notes for the kids. Here's what you're supposed to do today and here's what you're supposed to do tomorrow. But it taught President Carter the importance of healthcare, that it, it, it affects everything. And then there are so much that affects whether someone has the ability to, to get good health care. Doctor, thank you very much. Rose, as always, it is a pleasure uh, to have you uh, in, the, uh, in the conversation. The book, The Contagion Next Time, is available from Acapella Books with signed book plates. Doctor, Rose, thank you all very much. And thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Take care, everyone. Take care. Bye-bye.